Hello, everybody. Um, like many other people who've given a webinar in this series, it's the first time I've done this. So um, let's hope it works fine. So thank you very much for coming. I know for many of you, this will be probably after school. Um, and I appreciate you uh, logging in. I'm going to talk today about reading and language disorders. And I'm going to consider whether they're the same thing or whether they're different things. So maybe just to start us off, you can have a little think about a child you know or an adult you know who's got reading difficulties and have a think about if they have any other difficulties. And in particular, do they have any difficulties with spoken language? Um, so if you just hold that in mind, um, as we go through the, uh, the webinar, you'll uh, be able to perhaps consider what the scientific evidence is on this kind of question. But let's start off with something that I know you're very comfortable with, which is the simple view of reading. Now, you know that the simple view of reading uh, simply says that reading comprehension is the product of decoding and listening comprehension or linguistic comprehension. Decoding itself is built on letter knowledge and phonological awareness. And in English, phoneme awareness, the awareness of the simple sound, the single sounds of words is quite important. Um, and by linguistic comprehension, all we really mean are the oral language skills that we possess. And in particular, vocabulary and grammar is important here. Now, if I can just pause for a minute, I'm getting quite a lot of feedback. I don't know if there's, uh, we'll see if we can fix that. Um, and then I'll just proceed, because I think next I have a question for you. So uh, the first question, uh, which you'll have had a little while to think about perhaps, is, is dyslexia a language disorder? And so simply yes, no, or sometimes. So I think that Fraser's going to be able to relay me what your answer to the poll is. Yes, I'm just waiting on a few people to respond just now, and then I'll let you know what their result Thank of you. that is. Okay, I'm just going to close that now. It's been a while. Okay, so speedy. Sharing on, sharing on screen just now. Um, the answers for yes are 34%, no 28%, and sometimes 38%. All right, well, my math suggests that's about equal Stevens, really. About a third of you thought each answer, and I think that's uh, very interesting. Uh, for many, many years, researchers thought that the answer was no, that it was a very specific phonological deficit. Um, and now I think we think probably some of the time dyslexia is accompanied by a language disorder. But let me just uh, now tell you a bit about, about some of the evidence. Okay, so let me see. Next slide. So on this slide, we just have some definitions. Now, um, I'm going to use the term dyslexia. I don't know if that's allowed uh, in your neck of the woods, but it's also often referred to as reading disorder or uh, in the, uh, a, uh, the APA's uh, DSM-5, which is the uh, classification system of all sorts of disorders. Dyslexia is described as um, a specific learning disorder, which affects the development of reading fluency and spelling. Importantly, to uh, get the uh, kind of di diagnosis, the, uh, these difficulties need to be persistent over time. And we know from a very large body of research that dyslexia is associated with phonological deficits, that is deficits in processing the speech sounds of language. Now, less well known is a communication disorder called uh, developmental language disorder or DLD. DLD is characterized by, again, persistent difficulties, but this time in receptive and or expressive language. And in terms of the reading system, DLD primarily affects reading for meaning. Um, 
so that's the conventional view. Both of these disorders are considered to be neurodevelopmental, which means that they're highly heritable, um, they life they span the lifespan, and they frequently co-occur with each other. And obviously, it's quite important to understand their relationship because both can affect learning and attainment, and indeed uh, can have a downward spiral on uh, well-being uh, if they're not uh, treated or if there is no intervention. Okay, so you still there? Yes. Okay. Um, so how can we think about the relationship between DLD and dyslexia? Well, some 20, not 20 years ago, 16 years ago now, Dorothy Bishop and I uh, argued that if you want to understand the relationship between uh, language disorder and dyslexia, you need to think about two dimensions. You need to think about phonological skills, which um, vary in the population from weak to strong. But also you need to think about language comprehension skills, which also vary from weak to strong. And if we can think about those two dimensions, the way in which they intersect produces a number of rather different looking reading disorders. So classically, dyslexia is a, a deficit in phonology, but language is normal. So that's really the idea that dyslexia is not a language problem, just affecting the phonological system. In some children, there is difficulties both in phonology and language, and that would produce a profile of dyslexia with reading comprehension. So that's the idea that sometimes dyslexia is a language disorder. And then here we have another group of children who have been described as poor comprehenders. I think that uh, both Kate Nation and, and Jesse Ricketts earlier in this series will have talked about them. So they're children who have very good phonological skills, they decode well, but they have problems with language comprehension. And of course, what we'd really hope for is that all children had typical uh, reading, that is, they had good phonology and good um, language. So what, where does that uh, get us in terms of our current understanding of the relationship? This uh, framework, which was um, published 16 years ago, is there evidence that this kind of idea um, has uh, validity? So what I'm going to try and do uh, in the next uh, half an hour or so is first of all talk about some studies of children at family risk of dyslexia. So this is an important area of research because it allows us to track children who become dyslexic but from much earlier on in life and how so to identify the precursors of the disorder. And I'm going to then use some data of ours to talk about what dyslexia might look like in the preschool years. I'm then going to argue that language is a foundation for reading, not just for reading comprehension. And then I'm going to talk about a family risk study focusing on how at-risk groups turn out at the age of eight to nine which will allow us to think about some of the developmental pathways to poor reading. And lastly, if we've time, I'll talk about some implications for intervention. So let's start by thinking about studies of children at family risk of dyslexia. So in 2016, I published a review with Monica melby Lervag, who is an expert in uh, meta-analysis, um, in which we surveyed all of the published uh, studies of children at family risk of dyslexia. So this was around about 90 studies. And this is a picture taken recently at Christmas of Monica and me with uh, Kate Nation. So uh, first of all, what is a family risk study? So in a family risk study, the researchers recruit children who have a first degree relative with dyslexia and they follow them from preschool usually through the school years until they're around about in grade or year three, age eight to nine, and then they uh, assess them and they can classify them as to whether or not they uh, are dyslexic, uh, 
And that leads to three groups, children at family risk uh, of dyslexia who develop dyslexia, children at family risk who don't develop dyslexia, and then we have a typically developing control group. What we know from all of these studies is that the average rate of dyslexia in families where there's a parent affected is about 45%. So that's quite high compared to around 10 to 12% in the normal population. So if you are a dyslexic parent, every other child, if you like, in your family is likely to have dyslexia. Once you've identified which children are dyslexia in this kind of study, you can then track back in time and look at the data you've collected and work out what the characteristic developmental profile is of a child with dyslexia. And when we did the study, there were published studies across the range of different writing systems from Finnish, which is the most regular writing system where the letter sound correspondences are very regular, Dutch, Danish, English, which is the most irregular system, and also Czech. And since then, we've published another study, which was on um, Czech and Slovak. So what do these studies tell us? Well, um, you can, of course, read this. I've given you the link to the PDF, but this is a very simple summary of what we found. So if you take children, um, if you take the studies which have looked ch at children at family risk of dyslexia in infancy, or in preschool, you can compare them with children from uh, families where there's no history of reading difficulties. And what you find for the at-risk group is that they show some atypical auditory or speech processing very early on in infancy. And then during the preschool years, they show slow language development. And from a very early stage, they show problems with phonological processing. That's in non-word repetition and in very early measures of phonological awareness, like measures of uh, rhyme, uh, for example. In terms of outcomes, children at family risk of dyslexia end up in one of three groups. They might actually not have dyslexia at all, although I'll come back to what those children look like in a moment. They may be diagnosed as dyslexic, or they may be dyslexic and also have poor reading comprehension. Now, this in many ways is a continuum. It's not a clear cut uh, dimension with clear cut categories like, say, measles, not measles. It's actually a dimension of severity. Um, but nonetheless, what we want to know is why some children at family risk end up with uh, dyslexia and uh, why do some end up uh, escaping from that disorder? And what the outcome seems to depend upon, according to all of these studies that we looked at, is whether or not their delayed language in preschool persists. So the probability of being dyslexic if you're at family risk seems to turn on whether or not your language difficulty persists into the school years if it persists, you're more likely to have a dyslexic outcome. If your language difficulty resolves, you're unlikely to become dyslexic. But what's very interesting as an idea from these studies we looked across is that many of those children um, whose language difficulty resolves still have problems with phonological awareness. And although they're not actually dyslexic, they end up with some aspects of dyslexia, like a spelling problem, or maybe some problem with non-word reading. Now, these data are interesting because they suggest there's some association between being at family risk of dyslexia, having a language problem, and having a phonological problem. And what would be great to do would be to unpick those different aspects of risk. And this is what we tried to do in a longitudinal project called the uh, Welcome Language and Reading Project, which we conducted in York starting in 2007. So to that study, we recruited three groups of children. First, 
children at family risk of dyslexia. Second, children who were referred by speech and language therapists who had preschool language difficulties. At the time, the diagnosis was called specific language impairment or SLI, but I'm just going to refer to it as language difficulties. And the third group was a control group of children deemed to be at low risk of reading difficulties because there was no history of reading problems in their family and there was no history themselves of language problems. So we had about 260 children initially and we assessed them first of all when they were three and a half, then at four and a half, whoops, sorry, one, then at five and a half, six and a half and eight. So we, we assessed them at approximately annual intervals and it was at time five when they were eight that we decided which of them had a dyslexic outcome. And I'll come to that later. Just a little bit more about our recruitment strategy. Once the children had been volunteered for the study, either by their parents or schools or speech and language therapists, we assessed all of the parents. So parents would self-report as to whether or not they were dyslexic, but we would also assess their literacy and, um, and their language skills um, to confirm that uh, diagnosis, if you like, and also to identify some adults who had problems but hadn't had a diagnosis. We also counted as being at family risk, children who had older siblings who'd had a professional diagnosis of dyslexia. So that was the first phase. And then what we did was for every child, we assessed them on a battery of language tasks so we could work out who fulfilled criteria for, if you like, preschool DLD, or as we called it at the time, SLI. And to be regarded as having an, an early language disorder, they had to score below average or below our criterion, that is, um, on uh, two out of four tests tapping uh, receptive and expressive language. And so those tests are detailed here. This actually led us to end up with four groups, Ch children who were typically developing our control group, two groups of children at family risk, one group who were just at family risk, but another group who were at family risk and had a preschool language problem, and a group of children who had a language problem but weren't at family risk of dyslexia. So you've got kind of two risk factors here. You've got family risk, you've got language difficulties, and you've got one group that's got both. Now in preschool, if we're thinking about the language profiles, there was no difference between our two language impaired groups, sorry, this group and this group and the group. In terms of language skills, they were actually identical. The difference was only that one of those groups was also at family risk. So let's now look at the language profiles in the preschool of those uh, three groups of children, because I'm going to look at children who are typically developing children at family risk, and then a combined group of children with language difficulties, some of whom also were at family risk. What we've got on these graphs, it's actually figure one of this PDF if you want to look, is on the bottom, we've got a measure of uh, phonological language. So the x-axis actually looks at performance in a non-word reading test, non-word repetition test, I'm sorry, on each, uh, in each of the graphs. And the y-axis is their performance on language tests. So we're pitting here two of those dimensions that are in the uh, Bishop and Snowling model uh, against each other. So we've also put onto these graphs the uh, lines which represent one standard deviation below average. So this is actually um, average, but this is one standard deviation below. So if you look at children, first of all, who um, are typically developing, most of them are up here, that is, they are within the average range for both skills. Obviously, there are one or two outliers. If you look at children at family risk of dyslexia, I think you'll see that more of them have got uh, poor phonology, so they're below this line, 
but they've got good language, they're above that line. So they've got more specific phonological difficulties. And the group with language impairment have got poor language and poor phonology, although there's one or two of them who've got quite good phonology. So in terms of the preschool language profile, if you think dyslexia is a phonological deficit, you might think this, these two groups are at most risk of dyslexia. And of course, we already know the children at family risk are, about 45% of them across studies seem to be affected. And we also know there's a high prevalence of reading difficulties in children with language disorders, though many of them also have reading comprehension problems. This is a very much simplified version of that data, and it shows that um, if you take the two groups with language difficulty, they have language deficits, that's just a tautology, the family risk group doesn't, but all of these risk groups have phonological difficulties. Just briefly, it's not just phonological language difficulties that affect these groups. So amongst typically developing children, some 6% have difficulties with motor development or with attention control. In children at family risk of dyslexia here, some 18% have these co-occurring problems with motor or executive attention. And if you look at the children who are language impaired, some 46 have some additional problems. And we think that's quite important, although at the moment it's quite difficult to pin down exactly what the causal status of these sorts of difficulties is. Okay, now I'm going to hopefully convince you that language sets the stage for reading. And I'm going to uh, show a very simplified version of some models which show this, which are, if you want to look at the more complicated version, figure one in this paper by Hume et al. So uh, here we see um, a, a, a model of the measures of language that we gave when these children were three and a half years of age. And it was these measures, it was the same measures that we used to classify them as language disorders as not. And I've put in this pinky brown, three measures which might be called more phonological aspects of language, like articulation, word and non-word repetition. And then in blue, we've got um, difficult, uh, uh, sorry, measures that are of broader language. So vocabulary, expressive and receptive grammar and uh, verbal concepts. Now, all of these measures can be loaded together on a factor called language. And that accounts for the shared variance, the shared skills across those measures. And I'm just going to call them language. When you do that, there's some what we call residual variance left over. And these three more speechy um, measures also load onto a secondary factor called speech. But for the moment, all you need to know is that language was a very robust factor at three and a half, and there's a secondary uh, factor which looks to be to do with speech, but not language. So literally articulation and, and those kinds of things. What we want to do now was to see how these early measures of language predicted measures of what I would call the foundation for reading, the triple foundation, at age four and a half. So the measures I'm talking about here are phoneme awareness, letter knowledge, and rapid naming. And each was measured by two tests. We had RAN objects and colors. We had saying letter sounds and writing letters from sounds. And we had two measures of phoneme awareness. And what this uh, diagram shows you is that language was a predictor, a significant predictor of all three aspects of this triple foundation. Of course, triple foundation also was these measures were intercorrelated with each other. Now, interestingly, speech was not a predictor of those measures. And that really corresponds to what we know, which is that children who have speech disorders, who don't also have language disorders, 
are not at elevated risk of reading impairment. Now, the next step in our analysis was to look to see how this triple foundation predicted later decoding ability and later reading comprehension. So we know from a huge amount of research that RAN letter knowledge and phoneme awareness predicts reading. And indeed, if we look at decoding at age five and six in this sample, it's letter knowledge and phoneme awareness that are the strong predictors. And I sometimes like to think of these as the alphabetic foundation. RAN is not, and that's, I think, because decoding here is not a fluency measure. If we'd measured fluency or measured decoding later, RAN, I'm certain, would be um, a, a, a predictor. So what we know now is that language has an impact on decoding, which is mediated by phonological awareness and letter knowledge. It's the foundation of the skills that are most closely related in time to decoding, but it is an important foundation. And there's another important aspect of this model as well. So we also wanted to see how decoding predicted reading comprehension two years later at the end of our study. And what we found was that decoding was a predictor, but also was language. And language from three and a half actually predicted reading outcomes at eight and a half. This was a long range predictor. And this is what you might regard as the simple view of reading. So reading comprehension is the product of decoding and language comprehension. So really, by going through that, what I really want to stress is that language is the foundation for learning to read. And it's the precursor to the development of phonological awareness. We talk about language having its effect on decoding via phonological awareness and letter knowledge. That's a kind of mediated relationship. And so that same mediated relationship is a predictor of reading comprehension. But in addition, there's a long range impact of early language on later reading comprehension. Now, if that's correct, then the preschool risks for learning to read uh, include both poor phonology, which we've known for many years, but also poor language. So let's now turn to the outcomes for these children when they were age eight. So remember, we've got in our sample children at high risk of dyslexia because they've got a family risk or because they've got a preschool uh, language difficulty. We define dyslexia according to the DSM-5 definition. It's a pattern of learning difficulties characterized by problems with accurate or fluent word recognition, poor decoding and poor spelling abilities. So we took as our cutoff criterion here, one and a half standard deviations below the mean of our typically developing control group on a measure that combined word reading and spelling and that was equivalent to a standard score of 88. We also were interested in those children who ended up with developmental language disorder. Again, we looked for children with deficits in, in language comprehension or production, and we took a cut of 1.5 standard deviation below the mean of the typical group on a, a composite measure of vocabulary, receptive and expressive language. So we can look at this sample now in terms of reading outcomes, and we can also look at the terms of uh, language outcomes. So I think I've got a second poll here. So of our risk groups, which children do you think are at highest risk of dyslexia? Is it children at family risk of dyslexia, children with preschool language difficulties, or are, is the risk equal? So I'll give you um, a moment to think about that. And uh, if you're quick, you might want to ask yourself a supplementary question, um, which is there, uh, which is actually a more precise question. What percentage of each group are dyslexic at age eight? So let's see what the answers are. 
Okay, so the results that have come through for that question are uh, family risk of dyslexia, 20%, preschool language difficulties, 30%, and equal risk, 50%. Okay, well, I think that's a great set of estimates <laughs> in the sense that that actually is more or less not just the prevalence of your voting, but the prevalence uh, that we find. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, let me show you. Perhaps you've already had a look. So first of all, in controls who don't carry risk, about 7% of them are dyslexic at the age of eight. So these have got typical language in preschool. If you've got typical language in preschool, but you've only just got a family risk, 26% are affected. If you've got a language impairment in preschool, but you're not at family risk, 26% of you are affected. That's exactly the same as for family risk alone. And if you've got both risk factors, preschool language impairment and um, family risk, about 40% of that group are affected. Well, sort of, uh, because there's a complicating factor. And the complicating factor is that this is predicting dyslexia outcome from age eight from language difficulty at age three and a half. And we know that some children, you remember, resolve their language difficulties by the time they go to school. So what we also want to look at is the um, outcome for language impairment. So about in our sample, I'm sorry, about 50% of children with preschool language difficulties actually resolve those problems before they go to school. And uh, we we wrote a paper about this, which is which is there if you want to have a look. So when um, we started the study, all of our language difficulty groups had language problems, and none of our other groups did. But by the end of our uh, study, almost 20% of the family risk group now had a language problem, and some 50% of the language gr impaired groups. Um, had resolved their problems, so now only about 75% of them had uh, DLD. So we can now look at outcome according to current language and family risk. So it's a bit complicated, but here it is in this slide, and this is what um, is quite impressively similar to some of the, uh, the way your poll came out, actually. So if you take account of a DLD outcome, if you're typical 7% affected, if you're at family risk, but you no longer have a language problem, it's about 17%, so less than the 26 that we might have guessed. If you've got developmental language disorder, it's 35%. And if you've got both risk factors, it's 45%. So what we've got here is a pattern of what we call additive risk factors. So how can we think about that? So I think we can think about that in terms of this sort of a model, which is taken from my little book on dyslexia. These are neurodevelopmental disorders. So we know that that means there are many genes involved in the uh, inheritance of these conditions. And what these genes do is they code for risk factors, sometimes called endophenotypes. And you can have one or more of these risk factors. I would argue that the main risk factor for uh, dyslexia is um, a phonological problem. But if you have other problems as well, let's say a language problem, the probability that you'll get a diagnosis is increased. So this is the outcome, the phenotype, and the likelihood of diagnosis is increased the more risk factors that you bring to play. And sometimes, of course, we refer to comorbidities. Comorbidities are co-occurring factors. And you might have been thinking about the child in your class who has some other problems as well. And I think the more co-occurring factors you have, the more likely you are to have a dyslexic outcome, even though these deficits are actually not themselves dyslexia. And I think that's just another way of, of, of casting this. 
um, and also just to perhaps, i um, not quite sure I've got this later on. Yeah, I'll come back to this later on. So the main risk factor might be phonology and a second risk factor might be poor language. If you've got two, more likely to have dyslexia than if you've only got one. So now we can think, so how do we know how these risk factors turn into dyslexia? And what we can do here is something that we refer to as a retrospective analysis. So now we start with the eight-year-old outcome uh, data. And we've essentially got three groups. We've got children with dyslexia at outcome, and we had 21 in our study. We've got children who've got DLD only, not dyslexia. And we've got children who've got DLD and dyslexia. We've got a whole bunch of people with a typical control, but we're going to compare them only with the group who are actually recruited at typical, as typical controls. So in here, actually, we've got some people at risk who've got a normal outcome, but I've taken them out and I'm only comparing now with the typical uh, group. And this bit I'll, I'll go through fairly quickly um, because what we're doing here is I'm plotting the deficit of these groups defined at age eight, dyslexic, DLD and comorbid at age three and a half, four and a half, five and a half, six and a half, no, that's not right. Three and a half, four and a half, five and a half, yeah, six and eight. That's it. In blue are the children who go on to be dyslexic, and this is language. And you can see that in the preschool years, they don't have any language difficulty. If this thing goes over the zero, it means no difficulty. But the language disordered groups have got big difficulties. If we look at uh, that after they enter school, interestingly, the children with dyslexia seem to develop some language problems. The comorbid groups always have language problems. They're the biggest problems, but the DLD also language. So basically what that says is that in preschool, we really have got a group of children who've only got fun, who, who haven't got language problems, but they go on to be dyslexic. And if they're going on to be dyslexic, when they get into school, they look as though they're at risk for developing some language involvement. This contrasts with what we find for phonological skills. So these are the phonological skills we measured again in those four groups. And if we look at the blue again, these are the dyslexic kids, and this is when they're three and a half. Now the deficit is significant. It's well above that of the control group. The control group are basically zero on these graphs. Their phonological difficulty isn't as great as that of the language impaired groups in preschool, but it's very large and actually it remains large over time. So they have an early arising and persistent phonological problem. One really interesting group is the DLD only, because in preschool they've got phonological problems, but actually their phonological problems look as though they get a bit better over time. And we can see that again if we look at the foundation skills, phoneme awareness and rapid naming. So we've got problems for the dyslexic, the blue group, at every time point in phoneme awareness and in rapid naming. Similarly for the comorbid group or dyslexic with DLD. But DLD only start off with a problem and the problem gets less. So that pathway of phonological development can help us differentiate amongst language impaired children between those who go on to develop dyslexia and those who go on to have a normal outcome. And you can look yourself at other aspects of this in the paper. You get the same pattern for decoding. So of course, by the time you get to eight, that DLD only group don't fulfill criteria for dyslexia. Their phonological skills have been improving over time. Whereas for the children with dyslexia, those phonological problems have remained constant over time. So just quickly then, which groups do you think have reading comprehension difficulties? So we could have dyslexic, DLD, comorbid dyslexia, DLD, or all of them. This is where you have to think about the simple view. 
And if you're quick, there is a supplementary question there. What else do you think might contribute to poor reading comprehension? Okay, I'm just going to close that poll now and share the results. Uh, we have dyslexia at 3%, DLD at 8%, comorbid DLD at 22%, and all of them at 67%. Right. <laughs> Very good. Okay. So here's the data, basically. Um, this is a reading comprehension on the York uh, assessment of reading and comprehension. Orange is time five when they're eight, and we followed them up at time nine for this, which is the blue and um, very sensitive there. And you can see this is the dyslexic group. They've got some problems, not huge, sort of borderline reading comprehension problems, language impaired kids, big reading comprehension problems, children with both disorders, even bigger. And there's a really neat uh, pattern for time six when they're nine, it's additive. So here's your decoding problem. Here's your language problem. And sorry, I can't find the, the mouse thing. Uh, and here's the comorbid. So it's almost like you put one stack on top of the other. So the simple view of reading isn't really a product of decoding and language comprehension, it's additive. You can add the two things together. Um, I'm aware I should stop and let you ask some questions, but just to say, it's not all a council of despair. We inherit not just risks, we also inherit compensatory factors. Children with very good language, but with poor phonology, often end up with the broader phenotype of dyslexia, which is that pattern with a little bit of poor spelling, perhaps slow reading, but not the full-blown uh, disorder. So, in terms of the relationship between uh, reading and language disorders, dyslexia is associated with core phonological deficits, and they have their main impact on the development of decoding and spelling, but I think it's quite important to bear in mind that they can have effects downstream later in development on the development of other language skills, such as vocabulary. Um, in children with um, DLD or with language difficulties, um, if you have poor phonology, it's that that is a risk factor for poor reading. Um, those with persistent DLD succumb to problems of decoding, but some children overcome their phonological difficulties and they learn to decode and spell well, but some of them are poor comprehenders. So really, the relationship is a complicated one. You knew that already. Dyslexia is heterogeneous, and so is DLD. And in terms of other things that might affect their learning to read, some of those additional comorbidities, particularly aspects of attention difficulty and executive control, might affect focus in the classroom, but also in specifically reading comprehension. So I don't have time, I think, to go into implications for uh, education. But I have just put in the final slides that I think reading and language disorders, I know they are amenable to intervention. We've developed an evidence-based approach called NELI, and there is a nice video there of our NELI program in action on the Education Endowment uh, Foundation website, which you can look at later. So I think, Fraser, I should stop there and take some questions. Okay, thank you, Maggie. Uh, we're now going to begin answering the questions submitted during today's presentation. As a reminder to our attendees, you can still submit questions through the questions pane, which you'll find in your attendee control panel. Uh, our first question is from Hannah, and her question is, uh, could you talk a little bit about how the language delays that result from economic disadvantage fit into this picture? Yes, that's a very good question. Thank you, Hannah. So the question is about the link between social disadvantage and language difficulty. I think the first thing I'd want to just say is we have to think here about intergenerational disadvantage. We have to ask why do families become 
socially disadvantaged and the usual reason is because their parents have poor educational outcomes and the reason many children have poor educational outcomes is because they have language difficulties. So what children in these um, stricken circumstances are dealing with often are genetic learning problems, language problems, and also poorer home environments because their parents don't really have the language ability to give them a rich linguistic environment. So they really are um, at a double disadvantage. In our research on, on Nelly, as it were, we've only targeted kids at social disadvantage. So all of our work with those interventions uh, which should deliver language are um, focused on children with um, who essentially are on pupil premium in, in England. I don't know what that is in Scotland, but you know, the kind of free school meals are sort of disadvantaged kids. And we show that our interventions work for them. So I think the answer is lots of work on home learning uh, so that these children come to school as best prepared with a good language foundation and, you know, support for parents who a lot of the time probably don't know how to help. OK, thank you, Maggie. Our second question is from Susan. Uh, she asks, do you have any research on glue ear and dyslexia? I haven't done any myself, but I've been somewhat involved um, with Julia Carroll's work in um, Coventry, uh, who's looked at the ALSPAC data. So that's the big birth cohort data, looking at um, intermittent hearing loss and outcomes for phonological awareness and reading. Um, Gluia does affect the acquisition of phonological awareness to some extent, but it's a fairly mild impact. And again, it it's a very, very mild risk factor for reading problems, but there's no reason why it should have any major impact. So I think if it often, Dorothy Bishop showed this many, many years ago, that often kids with glue ear get referred to con ENT consultants because they've got poor language. And it sort of turned out that if you had glue ear without poor language, you weren't getting referred. And the real problem was that children with poor language. So if you've got if a child's got poor language, the first thing people will check out is whether they've got a hearing problem. And, and they may have, but that's not going to be the cause of their learning problems. OK, thank you. Uh, we have a question here from Kirsty. How can we best support children with dyslexia to minimise the decrease in their language skills over time? Well, I think that's a good question. And so undoubtedly what we're talking about here is uh, vocabulary uh, instruction and vocabulary enrichment. You might be aware of um, the work on robust vocabulary instruction by Becca McEwen, um, which basically talks about helping introducing children to vocabulary that's productive so that's not the regular vocabulary we use in conversation and it's not very technical vocabulary that we use in academic areas but it's words that have quite a lot of use um, and we primarily um, learn through print so the work we do basically works around books and looks at the vocabulary in books and teaches new vocabulary in a very direct way using a multi-contextual approach. So children learn the meaning of the word, they learn to say the word, they learn the different senses of the word, and so on. And, and in Scotland, Marisha Nash's work in Edinburgh also uh, followed that kind of an approach. Actually, not for dyslexia, but it would be absolutely suitable for dyslexia. That's great. Uh, we have a question here from Sarah Palmer. Uh, her question is, what is your view of the value of coloured overlays if dyslexia is a phonological disorder? So I think this is an important question um, and one I'm often asked. Um, so this is about comorbidity. Um, because I think a well-founded intervention has to have a theory behind it, a causal theory behind it, 
the, the interventions that will work to help with dyslexia are essentially phonological and language based. So as Sarah points out, so what about visual overlays or colored lenses? Now, some children with dyslexia have a co-occurring visual stress. Now, the prevalence of visual stress in the normal population is about 6%, and it's about the same in the dyslexic population. So people with dyslexia are no more likely to need um, to have visual stress than anybody else. But my interpretation is that if you're dyslexic, you're already finding reading hard. And so anything else that's going to increase the discomfort will present to you as a problem. That's why many people seek out this intervention. And that's also why some benefit. But I think the evidence is clear. The benefit is marginal and it's not on reading. It's not on reading rate. It's actually on the reducing headaches. And the Royal College of Ophthalmologists have some good guidance about that on their website. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Annie McGowan. Her question is, should we be continuing to teach children with dyslexic, dyslexia phonics or should we switch to sight reading? Oh, this is a difficult question. Um, the best evidence we have is that a very highly structured phonic approach is um, the best, but we haven't really contrasted it with anything. We've contrasted it with uh, no intervention, essentially. I still believe it is the first approach that you should use, and we do know it works. We've, there's lots of evidence on that, and that's all can be found in um, various databases. But I think if you are basically you know, bashing your head against a brick wall and the child's had phonics for years and years and years, one, it's not effective, and two, they're completely fed up with it, so they're not motivated. And that's when I think we can start to think about introducing some other approaches, particularly perhaps teaching at the level of the morpheme, the meaning unit, um, rather than sight reading. But teaching them to analyze words for the meaning units can be helpful. But I also believe that at some point, and I don't know because I'm not an expert on assistive technology, that we should be introducing some uh, assistive technology to uh, children with dyslexia far earlier than we are. So we can use um, you know, text to voice readers, we can use voice recognition software for writing and I think really it, I think we should be exploring the efficacy of some of those approaches for kids with dyslexia who are not responding to intervention. Okay, thank you Maggie. I'm just going to ask one final question. Uh, this came through from Andrew. What are your current thoughts about why some children may fail to respond to intervention? Okay, so uh, failure to respond to intervention is an interesting one. It's something that we're looking at in our current trial data. In our previous work, we've often found that children not responding to the structured phonic and phonological awareness approaches that are um, used for children with dyslexic sorts of difficulties are not responding because they have co-occurring uh, language problems or because they have co-occurring attention problems. There's some evidence, um, not that people like medication, that actually combining uh, reading intervention with uh, pharmaceutical interventions can be effective. Not many parents in, in, in this side of the Atlantic are comfortable with that sort of an approach. Um, but the other thing that we've found is that our language interventions actually improve behavior and attention. And that's in part because we work on listening skills with those children. So I don't know, it's a really important area of research and it's something I'd like to look at. Um, you do need big samples to look at that, but we, we will, we're going to try and start doing that with, with our intervention data. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you very much for joining us today, Maggie. And okay. also thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar. If you have any other questions, please contact gtcs at gtcs.org.uk. That's gtcs at gtcs.org.uk.
once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on, of, on the presentation, and we would appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. On behalf of the General Teaching Council for Scotland, Professor Maggie Snowling and the LALCO Network, thank you for joining us today and enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.